Hello, and welcome to Inside BSKL, the podcast. This series aims to provide insight to parents from our very own world-class international educators. Tune in as we share experiences, strategies, and the unique dynamics of teaching in a global setting. This week, we will hear a conversation between Jade and Leah about the importance of well-being in an education setting and the perception of its definition and practices. Let's take a look inside BSKL. Hi, I am Leah Lewis, and I am the head of Early Years here at BSKL. I have been teaching for almost 14 years now, and I am teaching our youngest children this year, our two and three-year-olds in pre-nursery. And I am joined by Jade over here. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, uh, my name is Jade. I have been here for five years now. Um, I am the positive education and well-being lead and currently teaching year three. Okay, well, thank you for joining me, Jade. Mm-hmm. Uh, so today I thought we'd talk about well-being, of course. It's your uh, your forte and the thing that you focus on in our school. And you've done a lot already to change how we see well-being here and how we approach well-being in our teaching. Uh, but we also want to help our community and our parents to understand well-being a little bit. Now, I know when we first started talking about well-being, it was sort of a a buzzword Mm. and something that donuts in the staff room or um, just a a kind gesture was everybody's idea of well-being. But now we know that it's a lot bigger than that. Um, Do you want to talk a little bit about some of the things that you've done at school to promote well-being and what it actually means? Uh, Sure. I I think let's start way back with the definition of well-being, right? And I think that the whole world got a bit of an overhaul of what well-being means through the COVID pandemic. I think it really raised awareness for well-being for all people because it became such a priority, right? And I think the first and most important thing to say about well-being is that it is so hard to define, Right. Like I think institutionally, like you were like alluding to earlier, that people often put donuts in a staff room or they often do a small gift and that's well-being. But in reality, well-being, it's so much about the individual. And that's what makes it so complicated, because what well-being means to me is not what well-being means to you. And it's not what well-being means to your son. And it's not what well-being means to the next person that you bump into in the street. Right. Like it's so different. Um, And also not only is it different for the individual, but it's different for that individual minute by minute and second by second. So how can you really define it except for saying, well, being is what you need to thrive in that given moment. So that made it so tricky when we started thinking about bringing well-being into BSKL as an institution. Um, And the very, very first thing we did was make sure that we um, created a split between internal and external well-being. So external well-being being small gifts here and there, Internal well-being, meaning uh, giving people the skills and the research to understand themselves and supporting their own well-being. Because we cannot pour from an empty cup. So whether you are teacher to student, we cannot support the student's well-being if our well-being is not being taken care of. From parent to child, same thing. You cannot support your child's well-being if you haven't made some steps to support your own. And being a teacher, it's so easy to uh, support the children in this, mm. in this journey. And I know that we've done a lot here at the school to work on the, the positive education curriculum that we have. But as you just said, it's not just about the children and it encompasses our whole community. So how can we make sure that the parents understand what we do here and how can we support them in understanding well-being and that it's not just the um, the little treat at the end of the day that they give to their <laughs> child? <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, the positive education curriculum that we adopted uh, is absolutely incredible. It goes from EYFS all the way through to secondary and it's purpose is to explicitly teach well-being skills to the children. Now, the magical thing about a mental health curriculum as we have it is it's not watered down for the children. Those lessons can be applied straight from as we were delivering to the kids to how they would work for a teacher or for a parent or for any adult in any um, uh, faculty. Right. So the parent academy workshops that uh, that I've been running over the past few terms and can intend to continue to run for the foreseeable future are actually positive education lessons. We take them directly from the curriculum and then we deliver them to the parents. And in delivering that, we hope two main things happen. 
that we focus on self-awareness. So the adults in the room working on what their uh, understanding of themselves is and where they need to go next to support themselves. And also self-compassion, understanding that as the adult, I can accept that I'm not the expert in well-being. It's impossible to be an expert in well-being, right? So being compassionate to yourself to know I don't have all the answers about well-being. I'm going to work on my own skills through these Parent Academy workshops or through any extra reading that we always recommend at the end of those workshops, you know, and then from there I can support my child. So during your parent academies, what sort of recommendations do you give to the parents? Of course, uh, everybody is unique, as you said, and their well-being can be looked after in uh, a huge amount of ways. And I'm sure you don't go around one to one to each parent and giving them individual advice. So what recommendations can you give? No, you know what? That would be amazing. What an incredible session. But unfortunately, we cannot. We would love to. We cannot. Um, so like we said earlier, self-compassion and self-awareness are the two main strands of well-being that we really need to work on uh, as adults. To hit that self-awareness strand, I would recommend the character strengths, which are done by the Victoria Institute. You can do a quick Google and find that. That is so powerful for developing self-awareness because there are 24 character strengths. This is also the foundation of our positive education curriculum. There are 24 character strengths and you fill in a survey. It takes about 15 minutes to complete. Uh, and then you get your top strengths, which are things that come very easily to you. Uh, my top strengths include things like uh, bravery and... Um, uh, compassion, which I think is, if you you know me, those are probably yeah, my top character true. strengths. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then it goes to your mid strengths. So those are ones that you uh, don't need to put that much effort into use. And then your lesser strengths. Very important, these are not your weaknesses. Uh, these are just things that you need to work a little bit harder at to use. They don't come naturally to you. So you're feeling brave enough to tell us what your uh, lesser strengths are? Oh, of are course. <laughs> if I'm going to, you know, preach vulnerability and well-being, you have to, right? Absolutely. So my lesser strengths are actually teamwork which is oh, quite, okay. a, quite an interesting one this is a perfect way to illustrate that they are not your weaknesses I absolutely am capable of working in a team it's just for me and my personality I love to solve the problem first or work on the problem myself first and then pitch it to the team so for me if I have to start working with a team from the very beginning it's very difficult for me to go okay like let's pace ourselves let's you know take that take our time I'm more of a I want to try and solve it first and then pitch and hear ideas from everyone else at that stage. So it's not that I can't work in a team, it's that I have to put a little more conscious effort into it. Do you know, that makes me think about um, sometimes I like to go to gym classes mm -hmm. and people say, oh, do you want to come to the gym with me? Mm -hmm. Oh, let's go together to the class. But actually, I, I much prefer going on my own. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't want to work out with other people. I don't want them to see me all sweaty. And no. I'm okay to just do this for me. And, and organizing things like that with other people just adds an extra element. And sure. if for my well-being, I just want to go there and focus on me and... Mm -hmm. Uh, not on socialising with other people at that time. Yeah. Socialising with other people comes at another point and that is part of building and promoting my well-being as well. Mm. Um, but yeah, yeah, so exactly. So it's not a weakness of yours. It's just something that you need to put a little bit more effort in. But mm. having that self-awareness of what comes naturally to you and also naturally to your children from a parent perspective uh, helps you to have more understanding of each other, of why you may find things uh, more difficult you may approach tasks in a different way to each other hitting that self-awareness has to come first because from self-awareness comes vulnerability comes self-compassion and that is the only way to work on your well-being and let's go back to what you said at the beginning about how well-being became um, much more in the limelight during covid times mm. and i remember myself uh being in um uh, in lockdown and it was just me and my son and just being in the same four walls and it became very it was very quick that it became apparent very quickly that um, I needed to make sure that I was looking after my well-being and keeping myself sane <laughs> um, <laughs> to be able to look after my son. Do you know what and there is no shame and I think because there's so much um, labeling that goes on around the word well-being and sometimes it attracts a bit of shame, feelings of mm. shame. You know, it's not a weakness to work on your well-being. If anything, it is the ultimate strength to be able to have self-awareness and self-compassion and say, I do not have all the answers. 
nobody has all the answers, by the way, but to be able to say, I don't have all the answers and work on your wellness and help you. I prefer wellness to well-being. Mm -hmm. I think it has less of a stigma, mm -hmm. you know, but I think through COVID, so many people realized, hey, this is a time for me that I need to work on myself. And I really, you know, implore people to move away from any stigma they may feel attached to that, because that is not a weakness. That is an incredible thing to start on a wellness journey, a conscious wellness journey, and it will only bring good things in the future. And we shouldn't feel guilty when we are looking after ourselves um, and putting ourselves first before we're then able to look after for others. For sure, for sure. Self-care is never selfish. That's what they always say, isn't it? It's never selfish to look after yourself. You know, of course, if we only if I only worked on myself and ignored the whole world, that's not <laughs> that's not great, you know, but what that message is trying to say is work on fill your own cup first work on yourself first understand your uh, lesser strengths because we won't say weaknesses understand your lesser strengths you know in, the way we say it to the children in positive education lessons is let's say i'm teaching a lesson on resilience yeah and that which is a, an amazing skill for children to learn and adults to learn and i would say to the children who right now feels that one of their top character strengths is resilience? And then you'll get a couple hands here and there. You say, okay, who feels like resilience is one of their lesser strengths? It's something that they really have to try hard at. And if, after a few years of having positive pos education taught to them, you'll get a few hands, a few little vulnerable hands coming up and you go, amazing. Okay, that's why we are teaching this lesson is for you to boost up your resilience. And if we as the adults can start looking at it that way and go, hey, you know what? My forgiveness isn't always easy for me to access. I'm going to go away and I'm going to work on my forgiveness. I'm going to, you know, do some research into it. I'm going to attend one of the Parent Academy workshops on forgiveness and then <laughs> um, boost up that. Only then can you pass on that support to others and not yeah. just children, to your peers, to your family. It becomes like a very positive, I don't want to say, I want to say virus. I want to say something else that spreads you to <laughs> avoid virus. No, just let's not, say, we're not ready let, for that. Let's say ivy, like some kind of, you know, positive ivy that will spread through your entire community. But it all starts with the individual. You know, I was thinking the other day that uh, sometimes teachers or adults sometimes earmark these well-being activities and conversations to very, very young children, right? Like, you know, in your classes that you must talk every single day about well-being and, you know, taking care of others and taking care of ourselves. And then I think there's some weird thing that happens in people's perceptions that the children get to, I don't know, key stage two, year three. Oh, well, they're too big to talk about that now, right? And that's just, it's just not the case. Um, and it goes all the way up to the adult level, you know, as we said earlier, for example, uh, the Parent Academy workshops that we do are pos ed lessons. Um, the one I'm teaching uh, next week in the Parent Academy is a year five lesson on thinking traps. So that's about understanding that an action leads to a thought, which leads to a consequence. For example, you know, pulling in your experience with very young children. Uh, she doesn't want to play with me as the action. She must hate me or dislike me. That's the thought. The consequence is I will ignore her for the next two days. Whereas if you intercept at that thought level, she doesn't want to play with me as the action. What if the thought was she's having a bad day? The consequence becomes I will take care of her, you know, yeah. and ha developing that awareness is not just for young children. That goes all the way up to when we are adults. If I'm when I'm at work and I someone has walked past me in the corridor and not greeted me. My thought is, oh, no, they're mad at me. I must have done that last project really poorly. They're angry at me. My consequence is I will go and sit and ruminate about it for the next three days. You know, it's exactly the same. The thought processes and the experiences that the children have is the same as us. It's just the response that we need to give them that changes a little bit. So for the very youngest ones, you need to narrate everything because they can't verbally tell you their their thoughts. And so you need to make sure that you understand their thoughts, first of all, and say, oh, um, 
th- that upset you, didn't it? Uh, when they took your toy from you today, mm. that upset you. But you you don't need to say that to an adult. Um, you can just uh, no. show that empathy to them. And, and I think that's where when a parent is needing to support their children's well-being, it's understanding where they are developmentally. Do they need you to narrate it mm. or, or do they simply need you to have more of an adult response, which would be a prompt? So sometimes when I'm dealing with... Um, any coaching conversations with uh, colleagues or, or friends of mine, you know, and then they are saying, well, this happened and you go, okay, and you feel, oh, okay, and then what happened? You know, those prompting right. things are sometimes all the older children or adults need, but that would very much depend. Some days when I'm overwhelmed, I need someone to say, you feel upset because it's like, oh, yes, I do. <laughs> and yeah. that's okay. But most people, ad- adults and older children, just need a simple prompt here and there. Um, so one of our, our Parent Academy one that's coming up, we are going to be doing, uh, going to talk about the research that forms um the understanding of what thinking traps are, because all rooted in research. Everything that we teach, everything we understand about well-being is rooted in psychological research. So we start with the research, then there'll be a uh, role play activity normally, because that's the best way to understand how uh, these kind of social events unfurl. Um, and then at the end, of course, any further reading or further research or anything like that. But, you know, I was thinking back to when Emily did that uh, book club Mm -hmm. by Mm -hmm. parents and for parents Mm -hmm. right and what the great thing is about both the parent academy and the book club that uh, Emily did was that you've got parents with different experiences but Mm -hmm. also with different aged children so if they do have children who are in year six they have they've been through it they've been through it with their two-year-old many years ago but they'll be able to empathize and they'll be able to give you tips and uh, just sort of sit with you and say, I, I've been there. Mm. It, it passes. <laughs> and, and this is what helped me through it. And this is what helped my child through it. Yeah. Uh, so have, building those relationships and having those conversations is really helpful. Absolutely. You know, with wellness or well-being, we are never alone, right? Sometimes it can feel so overwhelming. And then in comes the shame. You know, I like to think about it like a lasagna, right? If there's an issue, that's your first layer of pasta. And then you worry about that issue. That's another layer. Then you worry about how other people are perceiving you perceiving that issue. And then it goes on and goes on until your lasagna is just too big to eat, right? And then you get that overwhelm tied in with that shame. And actually, we have to understand with any issues of well-being, acceptance comes first, compassion and understanding why I'm feeling this way. And then it's a very empowering thought, actually, that I can fix it. I can research it. I can make myself feel better about this. I can support my child through it once I'm in a a good space. You know, it's quite an empowering thought, I think. I think so too. And hopefully if uh, more of our parents join the Parent Academy, they'll be able to uh, pull on your expertise. I know you said that <laughs> and you're not an expert, but from our conversation today, it does feel like you are. Um, but also, as we said, building those social uh, communities to support one another in those times when it is really tricky. For sure. Thank you so much, Jade, for joining me today. Oh, you're most welcome. Anytime. Thank you. Thank you.